In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we'll have reflexes and wildlife and Max and GPUs next. Welcome back to yet another episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Dave Altavilla, and uh, we are uh, running flat out as usual. Three of us are here, my compatriots, the the brothers in arms with me, Marco Cipetta and Chris Getting. Fellas, how y'all doing? How y'all doing today? Doing pretty good, man. Can't complain. You know, been a little busy lately, but I, I, I feel like I'm slowly digging out from the pile. So it's all good stuff. <clears throat> Throw another one on the pile. What's that one? Robalo. What's his what's his name? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Robalo, I'm forgetting. The guy is uh, anyways, it's a cartoon. Uh, I'm I'm feeling a little little wonky, a little weird. Chris, how are you doing over there? Are you gonna balance me out with sanity? Uh I can try, but it's not gonna happen. Um no, I've just <laughs> rearranged my office a little bit uh to get some better pictures for my next review and uh trying a new camera angle but other than that uh just grinding just grinding i still got that ek fluid gaming rig behind you looking pretty all lit up that is a, a sweet rig we gave it away we'll be we'll be uh, talking about the uh, winner of that shortly look at things flying in front of me look out um and uh so that's coming up um but we've got lots going on uh lots in the mobile space um handsets you know coming out our backsides to be honest um <laughs> as well as uh, all kinds of stuff in the uh, graphics space these days and and more coming up um, on the horizon, as we know, uh, from the folks at AMD. So, I mean, man, it is just um, bubbling, bubbling with good stuff right now. Um, and let's, uh, let's dive into it and um, keep the banter to a, uh, a short fuse. Um, <clears throat> just mention a couple things that tripped through the news that if you haven't, gotten a chance to check out on the website yet at hothardware.com swing on by and check out our google pixel 5 review refined and feature rich that's a samsung drive oh you're putting it right on the on the home page nice yeah, <laughs> refined and feature rich with caveats we said and uh this was uh, a review by miriam joie uh the uh, illustrious miriam joie who uh does a whole lot of work for us in the mobile side, and she is an expert at uh, handsets. Um, Google's Pixel 5 is uh, a, a pretty impressive device um, in that it sort of offers the kitchen sink at a reasonable price, six-inch display, nice and optimized f format. Um, but, you know, for for the money, um, lacking in a couple of spots, um, you know, um, sort of a mid-range powered Snapdragon 765G uh, SoC, uh, eight gigs of RAM, which is a nice compliment, but only 128 gigs of storage. Um, killer camera as always, pixels deliver there. Um, but, you know, kind of a, you know, for $700, kind of a flagship price for, you know, what seems like in spots mid-range mid specs. I don't know if you had any opinion on that, Marco, um, but the Pixels, you know, there's one thing about them is I, I just love that bone stock Android, you know, clean, 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 always a, a nice snappy user experience. So maybe that Snapdragon 765G doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah, it's funny. It, I, I was toying with the idea of switching to the Pixel 5 temporarily just to see, because I mean, in in all actuality, if you look at the numbers, it's a downgrade from the Note 10 Plus that I carry around every day. But I just want to I just want to experience the the 765G and the clean Android day to day and see if I get used to it and just to see how it performs long term in the real world. But we'll see. I just I when you get used to a giant phone and then you try to carry around something smaller, it's it's a big adjustment. So I'm not quite ready to make the plunge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the 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 4A 5G that you uh, reviewed that's that's a little bit larger than the five, is it not? Yeah, it's a six. Yeah, a little bit bigger, six point two. Yeah, 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 yeah. But not not uh, not big enough for you. You like the uh, you like the big notes and all that good stuff. You know, <laughs> it's they're getting to the point where you feel them in your pocket. So I could go a little smaller, but it just seems stark. You know what I'm saying? Like it seems like a drastic reduction, even though it's not. So I think I just have to do it and you know see how I react. 
I totally agree, and and I'll give you a comparison here. This is currently my favorite handset. Um, I'm gonna get my big mitts off of it. This is the six and a half inch. I lost Dave's audio. Did you? Nope, I've got it. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, this is the six and a half inch uh, one plus eight T. And uh, let me light up the screen. It's gonna blow it out. But um, great yeah. device. Um, six and a half inch display. Um, and um high res display oled beautiful um and i don't know are we still have an audio problems chris no nope, we're no. all good okay. so good 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 all right well anyways this is a nice tweener size for those that like a larger display but don't want that thing like totally hanging out of your pocket this is the one plus eight pro this is my daily driver currently this is my buddy max passed away I miss you buddy um on the screen there that's a that's a 6.7 inch display a little bit too big for my liking the one plus 8t at six and a half inch is super optimized nice thin bezels there not a waterfall display square squared off screen really really well done um i like this phone a lot if it only had wireless charging what it does have is super fast 65 watt warp charging from one plus which is insane like i went from 19 uh, percent charge to 100 percent in 30 minutes just bang done um so you know another phone to consider as well 750 dollars for this guy uh 12 gigs of ram 256 gigs of storage a fat 4500 milliamp hour battery and one plus is doing some great stuff with cameras these days really capable camera 48 megapixel camera in this as well um and and beautiful, I, I I love this sort of blue anodized, light blue Very anodized subtle. finish. Yeah, yeah, really nice, good looking phone. Have to admit. Um, so really some good options. It, what's great now is that we're not you know we're not seeing the constant rollout of thousand dollar plus handsets, right? We're actually getting some mid range stuff. Yeah, and the mid range stuff it's it's getting harder and harder to differentiate. Like the benchmarks show us really stark difference. But the real world experience isn't all that different, you know, unless you're gaming, you know, it's like a PC. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, and all the games that I play are, you know, simple on, on my mobile devices. So that's why I'm toying with the idea of, of making a move. Yeah. And I will say, actually, a yeah, good point on that. The, the OnePlus 8T has a Snapdragon 865. So full fat Snapdragon high end chipset in there. Um, so performance is excellent. Android 11 as well, latest drop of Android. Um, and, uh, well, I should say Oxygen 11, which is a very lightly skinned version of Android 11. Um, but yeah, yeah, good stuff these days in handsets. Nice to see the $700 price range kind of being exploited versus, you know, again, the, the 1K and up phones um, or, you know, the, the lower end price points. I like that mid tier, that, that 700, six to $700 price range. Um, you know, you can get some some flagship kind of features for, uh, you know, you don't have to break the bank too much. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, let's move on to something else mobile that uh, really piqued our interest today. And um, that is the Acer Swift 3X. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What I you heard that. At? I heard that burp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hang on one second. I am drinking beer, so I, I, I did have a little in-between belch. You, Marco, <laughs> you totally sold me out. That's it. That's right. This is the this is the Greater Good Smooth. It is from uh, Greater Good Brewing Company here in Worcester, Massachusetts. It is fantabulous. And that's our plug for today. Chris is drinking water. Marco's drinking water. Why are you shaking your head? Just because I had a little burp? Come no, on. it's because I'm a psychopath. I smelled your burp. Like oh. I, I heard the burp. And then, like, my brain said, oh, a beer burp, and I smelled it for some reason. So we get, we get <laughs> smell vision here. Is that what we got? Yeah, okay, cool. Or you, or you have a psycho, you know, partner on the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that much is, that's a given. Yeah. So, um, right. right, let's get back to what I was trying to say before you, before I rudely interrupted you with a burp. <laughs> um, Asia's Swift 3X is the first Tiger Lake laptop to flex Intel Iris Xe Max discrete GPU. This was interesting. Now, um, we frankly didn't see this coming uh, because uh, speak of Intel discrete GPUs in laptops is yet to be official from Intel, from what we know. 
Uh, but the folks at Acer decided to just announce it today. So they either had, you know, an inside track and blessing pre-authorization. It seemed to us, maybe we, maybe we missed it. And, you know, we don't always catch them all, but um, it seemed to us that this was completely new information. Um, but yes, this is a discrete Iris XE variant of a GPU in this laptop from Acer. What can we expect? Uh, do we expect Tiger Lake, um, you know, uh, Tiger Lake uh, XE, Iris XE graphics performance uh, or more? I would think as a discrete solution, you could expect more, but we don't know anything about the configuration. All we know is that it's this machine is due in December to arrive to market. So thoughts, Marco? Um, I think you can definitely expect better performance. Um, if it's a discrete chip, you know, it's not a, uh... It's not sharing the, the thermal envelope with the CPU, and it'll also have dedicated memory. So you can bet the farm performance is going to be better than what we've been able to show with uh, Tiger Lake currently. And it's funny, there's actually a quote from, uh, from Intel's corporate VP and general manager of mobile client platforms. And he says, um, we've partnered closely with Acer to unlock new capabilities for creators on thin and light laptops with the unmatched performance of 11th, 11th gen plus the all new Iris XE Max discrete graphics. Mm. So it's it's funny, It's well not funny, it's interesting that they're targeting creators with a thin and light. So I'm wondering um, what kind of special mojo might happen here with them. Um, technically two GPUs in the system. You have Tiger Lake processor, all of them have integrated graphics plus discrete. So there's, there's a possibility for some cool stuff here. Yeah, I actually tuned in on, um on this uh, uh, briefing, or I should say, the, um, the what are they? What do they call it? I'm sorry. The the announcement uh, with with Acer, um, and they yeah they actually showed a creator doing his thing. There was some you know tablet pen and ink going on, uh, you know off to the side, and then this thing was handling uh, some animation work. Um, so yeah, they're they're very much targeting creators with this. Nice to see it. it, and it's a it's a 14 inch you know thin and light machine. It looks you know I would say kind of akin to the ASUS um, what is it G14 um, that uh, has um, you know Ryzen and, and uh, uh, oh let me think what am I blanking on that the ASUS G14 is is Ryzen the, the, the and Zephyrus. Yeah, Zephyrus. Zephyrus G14 Ryzen with uh, actually has a discrete Nvidia GPU. Chris, thoughts on this before we move on the uh, the Swift three X? Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly interesting. I, in general, have actually really liked my experience with these Swift series of laptops. I think I've used the the Swift three and then the the Spin five, which is very close enough related to it. So they're a good form factor for laptops. I like that. And I'm very excited to see what uh, the Intel XE graphics can do for it. Yeah, man. And it's coming in, in December. Uh, and you make a good point. You know, honestly, um, Acer probably doesn't get enough press or as much press as uh, they should. Um, they bring some pretty, pretty impressive products to market. They have a ton of product. Their portfolio is deep and wide. Yeah, I whether think, you talk laptops to displays to whatever. Yeah, I think a lot of people like to think of them as a value brand, but they're really not. They make great products. They just maybe their marketing's not up to snuff. Maybe that's it. Maybe they're still fighting the reputation from years ago. But I, I haven't had a Acer product recently that I've gone well. This is garbage. So, uh, you know, it's I've been impressed by all of it. Yeah, and actually um, shifting gears a little bit. Um, um, we'll, we'll get back to, to Acer here in a second, but just answering the, uh, the chat, we got Sanchez and Bootman uh, saying, Hey, why don't you guys have Frank Azor back on from, from AMD and, and Sanchez says, uh, the NVIDIA guy, well, guess what? Um, <laughs> Bootman, um, we we're, we have some guests lined up from AMD and Frank's one of them, uh, as well as other special guests in and around the Radeon graphics launch that's forthcoming. So stay tuned. And that's about all we can say. Uh, but we have the heavy hitters coming back real soon. Uh oh, so Francois in the chat. <laughs> Francois, we got to have you on. You'll you'll stir it up. <laughs> Francois, Francois is too busy flying his new plane home. 
Yeah. <laughs> his military plane, right? What is he flying? Is it some sort of French army or French air force? Uh, um, I'm not going to try to pronounce it and butcher it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so anyways, it, it seems like the graphics space is heating up. Uh, Intel is forever marching to that uh, 2021 debut of discrete graphics. Uh, and uh, But before the end of the year, they will have a discrete mobile graphic solution, allegedly in this Acer Swift 3X laptop that was allow, uh, allowed to, to be announced today that we didn't see coming, caught us blindsided. So, hey, why not? Cool. Way to do it. Way to do it and make a statement, Acer. All right. Um, where should we go next? Should we stay in the mobile vein or should we go to uh, hardcore gaming? Save that for last, maybe? Yeah, let's let's go mobile because that was a really interesting article. Yeah, this, this kind of... Um, this was one of those things. I, I woke up that morning, tripped over something, and all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, it possessed me. We have to dig in on this. And... Um, it was something that just, you know, crossed the radar with a new benchmark. And before you knew it, we were, we were, you know, going down the rabbit hole. 3D Mark Wildlife Benchmarks shows iPhones thrashing Androids, but Apple throttles hard. And that last bit is important because what really initially started out with us as, oh, my God, look at how much of a performance lead Apple has quickly turned into, holy crap, that performance lead evaporates if you keep stressing the, the iPhones. And it really sort of balanced out the picture. And also maybe perhaps Apple's strategy with how they design their phones thermally um, or how they tune their SOCs, power envelope versus thermal solution or what's available inside of a tight little phone like that, a device like that. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> what you, what we showed and what you see, uh, in the charts is that all of the iPhones from the I to tiny little iPhone SE with the a 13 bionic under the hood to the iPhone XS max, uh, with a 12 bionic under the hood skunking anything Android in this benchmark. Um, you know, and it's the difference between 46 frames per second in the top iPhone score. And admittedly, this is a GPU buster. Chris, I don't know if you can get those charts up. Thank you. Oh, you read my mind, dude. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, 46 frames per second for an iPhone 11 Pro. We don't have a 12 yet, obviously. Those just launched. Um, versus the fastest Android score from the Asus ROG Phone 3 at 25 frames per second. So major lead for Apple. That lead, however, almost completely disappears if you dive into the wildlife stress test, which literally loops the same benchmark 20 times until it, you know, reaches thermal saturation and the resulting performance is then graphed. And you see right there what an iPhone graph looks like. It It's basically sliding down the cliff while on the right kind of hard to see in that shot but on the right you see and uh you see android and snapdragon 865 in this case this is the uh one plus 8t that's actually i took that screenshot on it's that that is a flat line it doesn't budge the whole 20 runs whereas the iphone levels off or drops off a cliff and levels off within eight to ten percent of an android score in this benchmark and it's admittedly just a graphics benchmark for for phones um it's leading edge graphics uh on the iphone it, it's um uh mantle it's using the mantle api from apple and on android it's um it's vulcan um but leading edge graphics mobile graphics performance over time and the iphone craters thoughts marco we kind of this this evolved over the course of testing these phones, and it was fascinating. Didn't ex didn't expect to see this either. Yeah, so it's funny. Mm -hmm. This is like the classic: how do you tune your device? Like again, if you look at a phone like a PC, which we kind of have to nowadays, mm -hmm. Apple's probably done the smart thing. You know, single thread performance is very important for for the experience and for snappiness and for responsiveness and and 
they obviously have tuned their devices to really ramp the clocks and power for you know a single thread for these short bursty workloads but if you keep banging on it you're going to heat the phone up and it's going to have to throttle obviously for this particular graphics workload the android device is let's perform at a level we can sustain and maintain you know a, a certain level of experience that's a design decision i'm sure the android phone makers could totally change the power profile you know the frequency and voltage curve and say yeah we can we can rock some crazy high clocks on the gpu and a single core and we'll end up throttling as well and we'll change how those charts look now if you look at at the uh, the screenshots from the stress test and you see how far performance dropped like the iphone 11 pro the performance dropped about 48 percent from first to last run that would bring the frame rate exactly in line with the fastest android device so which one is really faster like it right. it depends depends how you use your device you yeah. know if, if you're going to sit on a train and play a game for an hour while you commute to work you know when the covid thing ends whenever if that was you you're going to probably get a better experience on the Android device. Your iPhone is probably going to seem great at first, and then 15 minutes in, you're going to go, what the heck? Why is this stuttering? Or or why is it not performing as well as it did? You know, so it's just a, it's an interesting design trade-off. And now with this particular graphics workload, at least, you can say, this is how Apple decided to tune this device, and this is what will happen under load. It's, 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 it's interesting to see. Yeah, I think you could argue that with a heavy graphics workload in general, Apple's going to throttle where the current crop of Android phones, and admittedly, we we tested Snapdragon 865 and 865 Plus in the Asus ROG Phone 3 only. Um, they they don't throttle at all. And I, I think, you know, for when you can, you can say if you exercise the GPU heavily, uh, then this is, you know, kind of what you're going to get between both platforms. What we did do was we we also checked CPU and sort of a rudimentary check simulating what um, 3D Mark Wildlife does, which is it loops its own benchmark, which is only a minute long. It loops it 20 times for 20 minutes. We also decided, okay, let's look at um, let's look at Geekbench and just exercise the CPU cores on the iPhone and see what happens there. Well, lo and behold, after a half a dozen runs or more. We didn't see any thermal throttling there. We didn't see any bleed in performance there. So it seems to me that, you know, Apple has always done, you know, a lot with um, fewer cores, fewer high performance cores in the A, you know, 13, 12, whatever bionic series of SOCs. But, um, yeah, they, you know, when you exercise the GPU cores, in conjunction with CPU cores, because you need CPU cores, obviously, to game as well, the SOC starts to, to heat up and throttle. But the, that, you know, sort of quick bursty and then general, you know, user interface, productivity, you know, whatever you might be doing on your phone kind of performance is maintained with, with fewer high performance cores on the CPU side, again, by design. Yeah, like it's it's funny. We have some good comments here. You know, Francois mentions, you know, um, oh, I almost read the wrong comment in life. If you measure the skin temp, you're going to see that the Apple phone gets hotter too, which would make total sense. And we have another comment. I think it's uh, Lion-O uh, is the first name. He's saying, to be fair, I've played on my phone for hours and the performance stayed the same. I don't know what phone he's referencing, but if it, if he's talking about an iPhone, as long as their performance remains good and smooth, yeah, this is something you're not going to notice, and it's totally a design a design decision that Apple made. This is not necessarily a bad thing. It's strictly it's a design decision. Is they're comfortable having better uh, peak performance and higher skin temps and letting it throttle. It's it's they could totally change it if they wanted to, but if this right. is the decision that they made. So yeah, it's just it was it was interesting that this new benchmark hit and we're able to just see such a stark difference, you know, right out of the gate, just running a stress test. And you know, those graphs are they couldn't be more different. It's literally a perfectly level line on Qualcomm and then just you know falling off a cliff with uh, with Apple. So and at yeah, the, uh, go ahead, Chris. At the same time, it, it is a stress test we're doing here. A lot of games probably aren't geared to milk every last bit of performance out of the GPU in the phones. So for most game titles, you could be playing them for hours on end and still not throttle them, even though some situations like wildlife, uh, is wildlife, right, um, can uh, 
induce the throttled performance. So, you know, it's going to depend how well the game is optimized, how much it actually needs, what it's targeting for performance, and a bunch of other factors as well. Yeah, and, and for me, that that's, a, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there, Chris. Um, f- for me, that, that was my takeaway from this, right? Um, there's tons of benchmarks out there, and, you know, every year we see the comparisons. Here's the iPhone, you know, versus Android, and it's, you know, Apple Silicon is just superior, and it's, you know, higher performance and all that good stuff. Um, you could make a case. I mean, obviously, wildlife, we saw max frame rates on the iPhone 11 at 46 frames per second. We saw max frame rates on a Snapdragon 865 or 865 plus phone uh, at around 25, 26 frames per second. Um, so in this heavy duty graphics, you know, uh, benchmark, that's the, that's the performance picture over one run and maybe you know the vast majority of games and mobile games don't actually hit that level of workload uh, because certainly they have to scale over a number of different devices and and be you know games have to run on lots of phones and so obviously developers target the 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 mean or median performance level um but what's important and what was what i took away from it and what i think collectively we all took with hey look benchmarks in in a vacuum yeah that's what they look like but there's lots of nuance to you know measuring performance and if you're gonna you know throw a stake in the sand and say you know this this is superior um well you know make sure you're covering all the angles in the case of you know this 3d graphics benchmark and probably 3d graphics over extended duration mm, apple may not have such a big lead yeah, and it all depends on how you frame the benchmarks. Like you could totally frame an article around sustained performance and make Apple look horrible with this kind of stuff. But then you could do like another comment just came in from Francois. You know, laptops have been doing this for a long time. And that's true. Like if if you take a, a thin and light laptop that's thermally constrained and you run Cinebench 10 times, the first run and last run are going to be very different. You know, and, and that's by design. You know, consumers want a thin and light. You have to make sacrifices. You can't have unlimited power in a tiny, tiny little space. You know, it is what it is. So, yeah, like it all depends on how you want to frame the data. If you wanted to create a benchmark suite that showed, you know, the 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 percent variation from a mean performance level and then add some temperature, you know, high temps in the mix might make Apple look really bad, you know, because their the expectation is higher based on that first run. So, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And then, then uh, Liono Dub um, says, uh, I guess Apple chipsets are better optimized than the Android ones since everything is in house. And there is quite a bit to be said for that. Um, Apple's tight coupling of silicon with, with their so- software platform or with the OS is, you know, well established. And that's the benefit of. The, you know, sort of the walled garden of development that Apple can achieve being the sole manufacturer of its product. Um, Android is an open source thing. It's got a lot of contributors. It's, you know, tasked with doing lots of different things. And so therefore, perhaps not as efficient from an OS silicon, you know, closer to the metal kind of um, view. And that's just the nature of the beast, at least for now. However, on the thermal side, and, you know, this will be interesting to watch in the days ahead, we have heard rumors not officially announced by Qualcomm that Qualcomm is coming to market eventually with a, um, a, a, a flagship device that is Qualcomm branded for Android. And um, I think it will be interesting to see what becomes of that, because here you're talking about likely a device that is the best incarnation of everything that Qualcomm's mobile platform has to offer um, and probably optimized for lots of things like thermals as well. But it's just a rumor right now. We have it on pretty good authority that it's where there's smoke, there's fire, but it's just a rumor and it could be fun to watch. But you know, riffing off Lionel's comment, what's another interesting sort of takeaway you you could sort of infer from this? I'm stretching a little bit, but you know, a- Apple's ability to build chips 
with their software in mind gives them a huge advantage in terms of optimization, right? They know exactly what the OS is going to need on their device and they can really fine tune better, really better than any Android device can. But if you look at Google's vision for Android and their selection of the 765G, it lets you know in terms of the what Google considers the ideal experience for Android, you don't need the flagship chipsets, right? 765G is much mm. more affordable. So that's just like an interesting takeaway there. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, that's a good point. You know, who cares so much about benchmarks? It's all about, in, in this case with handsets, it's all about user experience and feel. Um, we use benchmarks. I think they obviously matter because we use benchmarks to measure performance. Certainly performance within a device category, whether it be Android or iPhone, matters. And you want to you want to look at the subtleties of that and if depending on your requirement. But yeah, you know, what what is a good smartphone user experience? Well, these days, you know, you can you can get by with Snapdragon 765G just fine. Maybe in the future when you're looking at, you know, VR and AR and all this stuff uh, on your handset and it's much more, you know, mainstream, maybe, maybe not. Yep. And it's and two on just commented mm -hmm. the moment Google dropped flagship SOC for the mainstream, I lost all interest. And that's, <laughs> that's the plight of like the hardcore yeah. nerds like us. Yeah. I, I went through a stretch where I upgraded my phone the minute the latest phone came out. I needed it. I was experimenting with ROMs. I was doing all this crazy crap. And then it just got to the point where I was like, I'm, I'm not really noticing a difference. I'm nerding out and I'm loving it, but I'm not really noticing anything. So I've been riding phones for years now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Chris. I don't know about I don't know about for you, but for me, I'm I'm watching uh, app app transitions, app switching, um, page loading um, uh, with web applications, and uh, then occasionally, you know, some media streaming that I want to make sure looks crispy and smooth. Other than that, I'm not gaming a whole lot on my handset, and you know, Snapdragon 765 is probably plenty. Yeah, um, I think most people will notice in terms of smoothness, moving up to a higher refresh rate display um, over 60 hertz, going oh, yeah. up to 90 or 120 over yeah, the SOC differences between a mid range and a high range phone. Um, as long as the 765G can actually meet the 120 FPS needed to drive that display. Um, I've used Snapdragon 625, 626, 630 and wasn't too bothered by the experience, but I was also getting a lot of trade-off in favor of battery life with those phones. So as long as I can get more juice in my phone to last a day and a half to maybe three days, that's a trade-off that I'll be willing to make. Um, I mean, not everyone is bothered by having to charge their phones every night, but it's also nice to know that you don't have to. So right. I do like that aspect of the mid-range chips, um, especially that you don't always get with the 865s um, that are just not, a, not necessarily that they're sucking a ton of power, um, but that they can have those bursts that will drain you down a bit, um, driving more pixels usually in those devices as well is gonna impact your battery life. So the whole kind of um, integration of the phone from your processor to your display to everything else um, really makes the package. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I just dropped two links into the chat. One is the Apple versus Android or iPhone versus Android performance and uh, thermal performance piece that we're talking about here. The next one is the Google Pixel 5 review that we spoke about earlier. And Chris, to your point, um, Snapdragon 765 with a 90 hertz display puts up serious battery life even though it's uh, just barely 4,000 milliamp hour battery. Whereas Snapdragon 865 with a 120 hertz display falls a couple of three hours short, drop this to 60 hertz, and now you're talking, you know, uh, uh, another notch up. Um, again, it's all depends on what, <laughs> yeah, I did it again. <laughs> all depends on what your, what your requirement is. Do you want to, you want a fast display with good battery life in the case of the pixel five do you want to you know what what do you want to do do you need that performance um 
And if you want to save it, you know, in the SOC with the seven Snapdragon 765, you can do it and have the best of both worlds. High, re- high refresh rate display with, uh, you know, uh, great battery life and the Pixel 5. So, Marco, I, what were you laughing at before well, you laughed at me burping I, again? I, find, I have to take issue with the comment Lino just put in the chat. So okay. uh, Lino says, I think Apple does the whole future proofing better on their devices, though. Um they're literally being sued for planning the obsolescence of their phones and throttling through OS updates. There, there, there's a lawsuit going on right now. So um, maybe from the hardware level, they, they could. But the fact that they screwed their customers and slowed their phones down without telling them um, and kind of, you know, there's always that that feeling after two, three, four, oh, you know, iOS updates. Wow, my phone is slow. I need a new one. And uh, yeah, it turns out, yeah, your phone was slower because Apple slowed you down and now they're getting sued for it. So I, I have to take take issue with that a whole future proofing thing. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, that's, an, that's an important distinction. And I think what's what's interesting there is the very um, strategy that Apple employs yes. with, uh, yep. with respect to with respect to its thermal profile in the SOC, it really amps that thing up. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah, when you release an OS update, you're going to have marginality there as a result of that or, or a greater potential for it, right? Um, yeah, it's like, okay, whoops. <laughs> we just robbed you of a bunch of performance with this OS update by accident because we're kind of pushing the silicon a little hard in spots. Yeah, you know, the batteries degrade and they want to maintain the battery life. So it's like, okay, now we can't use our peak performance profile. And, oh, here's the sustained one. Wow, my phone doesn't feel the same. It's yeah. exact, exactly what we're saying with that piece. You know? And by yeah. the way, we popularized not swapping your battery because we've baked it in there with a ton of glue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, hey, we're you know, we, we, again, we're technologists here. We're we're not saying iPhone bad, you know, Android good. Um, you know, it's not that simple. Um, Apple's phones and certainly their OS, um, really slick, really well done. It's, I mean, they're they, you know, they have a a huge percentage of the market share uh, for a reason. Um, but you know, we're here to observe these things and prove them out, right? And that's what we did. And we're having fun with it. So there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's have fun with something else. Let's move on from the land of phones and laptops and talk about uh, the good old desktop and the gaming PC experience. NVIDIA Reflex tested low latency precision gaming at 360 hertz. Hello. That is some butter smooth gaming going on. And you really peered be in between the frames and and... And, uh, you know, what, what, what can the gaming experience, you know, realize with super optimized response times from input devices? So we have all these buttery smooth, you know, high refresh rate, uh, you know, monitors and, you know, the ability to drive them with seriously powerful graphics. But there's a human element here. It's not just what the hardware can do. It's how can the human interact with the computer and you looked at that, Marco, in this piece, looking at the NVIDIA Reflex technology. There's some fascinating results, I might add. Why don't you why don't you give us a little indoctrination there? Yeah. So I I mean, this is the kind of thing I wish I had a lot more time to go deeper into. We're just too busy. And there was some backstory here. So I had to shift gears on how I frame this article um t- to get it up in time. But yeah, so we 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 got the chance to to test firsthand NVIDIA's Reflex technology. It was officially announced, you know, with Ampere a few weeks back. And there's a handful of mice and gaming displays that have the NVIDIA Reflex latency analyzer built in. Now, a couple of weeks back, we looked at the NVIDIA Reviewers Toolkit and had a little device in there called LDAT that allowed us to uh, measure system... uh, average system latency. So basically the time it takes for you to click your mouse and for something to happen on screen, we can measure that time you know, very precisely. These new displays have a controller built in and an overlay on the panel, like it's not a physical device. You can you move a, a box on the panel to the spot you want to measure, and they essentially can do the same thing with a compatible mouse. The mouse is plugged into the display. You click the mouse button, and through NVIDIA software, through an updated version of GeForce Experience that I believe was posted today, actually, you can get a ton of latency data on your system and see you know, how different settings affect system latency. Now, 
these displays are being geared as tools for esports professionals. And obviously that's definitely the target market. Those guys that where every millisecond matters and you need the fastest refresh rates and the lowest latencies to, to have that edge. Absolutely, you know, this would make sense for those guys because there's tons of money at stake with esports. But like I kind of looked at it from a different angle once I dug in and started playing with it. I sort of feel like if you want to address something and fix it, you need data. If you can't measure it, then how do you fix it properly? This sort of gives like hardcore gamers and hardcore tech geeks another tool to learn about their system. And so I tested some stuff that you'd probably never do, you know, with a 300 panel, but I wanted to see how latency was affected using those settings. And, you know, what, you know, the, the big overarching message is faster frame rates and faster refresh rates typically mean lower latency, everything else being equal. But, you know, what if you want to try a different setting in a game or, or you know, just, you know, switch, a, you know, maybe turn on V-Sync for, for a certain title because you don't want tearing, like all this different stuff. I sort of tested all that. And, you know, what you find is what you expect. Lowest latency out of, a, you know, RTX 3080. I threw a 1660 in there to try to have, you know, more of a spread as well because the the when you're more GPU bound is when you're going to see the biggest differences. But overall, I, I thought it was really cool technology and you can get some really deep insight you know, into how your system behaves with different graphic settings. And it's not just about enabling or disabling reflex. You can test latency across basically any setting. Nice. Is, is this kind of where the market's headed in your opinion or is this super niche, you know, never going to be anything more than unless you're an esports elite esports gamer that really cares about you know driving the, the most you know responsive experience they can get for the, every edge they can get uh or is this something that you think could be productized and you know again for i don't want to say obviously when you talk about you know enthusiast gamers that is a niche in the market um could this be productized to 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 mainstream enthusiast gamers and the latency analyzer is a, is a tough sell because there's there's obviously a cost adder there, and if you have a fast GPU and a high refresh rate monitor already, um, you have low latency. But if the price isn't exorbitant and it just becomes part of the G-Sync module, then yeah, I mean I could see this being you know a cool add-on for for hardcore you know enthusiasts that want it. The the bigger thing for me that I think everyone needs to experience, you have to go try, like the cool thing with these panels, right? So I, I should mention, I tested the, um, let me get the model number right, give me one second. It was the um, the ASUS PG259QNR. So the QN without the R was the model everybody saw at CES, the 360 Hertz, 24 inch uh, full HD panel that everybody saw at CES. The one with the R on the end has the reflex analyzer built in. What's great about this monitor, right? The size is a little too small for me to use it day to day, but I totally would if it was bigger because one, it's an IPS panel. It's a it's a dual driver IPS panel. Uh, NVIDIA worked with AU Optronics to develop mm. this panel to get a high quality IPS, you know, all the benefits of IPS, but at that for high refresh rate and, you know, um, what's, what's that? I'm, I'm frigging drawing a blank here on the, uh, on the response times and super fast response Pixel. time yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. When you just use high refresh rates, even on the desktop, when you have a fast mouse and you have a high quality panel and a super high refresh rate, the smoothness of everything from mouse movements to selecting pixels in Photoshop to scrolling in your browser, it's just so much better. So I think everybody that experiences a high quality, high refresh panel will want that, mm. not necessarily the latency analyzer. Amen. And, and I would offer to Tuan in the chat, I've, he said, I've been, I'm still playing at 60 hertz and doing just fine, big smiley face. And I would argue that go ahead and fire up high refresh rate and compare your fatigue, your eye fatigue versus a higher refresh rate panel, whether it's yes. 120, 144, whatever you can get. I am sorry, but your eyes will thank you later. <laughs> so, and, and then we also have a qu another question from Lino. Uh, can, can you see 360 Hertz? Chris, there's a video in that article that shows the difference. Can yep. you bring that up for, is that possible to bring that up? Yep. There it is. 
So if you look at this, right, maybe in frenetic, fast-paced action, is there any way to zoom or no? Maybe you can't pick this out, right? But the fluidity of the movement is perceptible, right? And it's just less strain on your eye, more realistic. It's it's better. And that yeah. kind of fluidity comes to everything from scrolling to mouse movement. Like, it's just better. Yeah. And I dig it. Like, my eyes see it. You know, I was one of those guys when 3D effects was big and people were saying, you can't see the difference between 30 and 60. Yes, you can. And you can see the difference between 30 and 90 FPS. And you can see the difference from 144 hertz to 360 hertz, right? It may yeah. not be where you step in front of it in two seconds. You say, oh, that's 360 hertz. But when you experience it, you notice it going back to something slower, which right. means you are perceiving it. I would argue that at the expense of these GPUs, if you've got the firepower, right, at, at how costly these GPUs can be, you know, if you've got the firepower, you're silly not to consider a higher refresh rate setup because you're wasting that extra experience that's available to you. Um, you know, maybe you like running at 4K or high res, whatever, but if you can drive it, and, and your panel can support it, yeah, get off 60 hertz, get to 100, 120 hertz, 144 if you can drive it. Maybe it's not 4K. I happen to have a 3440 by 1600, 38-inch beauty in front of me right now, and I can drive that with a 3080 at, you know, uh, 100 frames per second in spots for sure, um, depending on the game title. But, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, you owe it to yourself if you've got the GPU firepower to try it out, to drive that panel, to drive a panel faster. So two two things, right? Um, yes, you're right. But the other benefit, even if you don't have the firepower, right, you can just On disable the desktop, yeah. What, but even in even in gaming, right, you, you can run at 360 hertz your panel, disable yeah. V-Sync, and yeah. it's going to tear far less because the panel's fast enough to not to, to draw uh, those good frames. Good point. Good point. Yeah. yeah. And then now Francois is saying, in fact, most people can't see above 40, uh, 60 FPS, but some do, and we shouldn't limit the market because of that. I totally agree. And when we first saw the 360 hertz panel, um, one of the comments was, I, I believe there was a big sign that said the road to 1000 hertz. Hmm. And that, that mm -hmm. might seem nuts, but I'm all for it. But the other thing, these... These studies where people say they couldn't see 60 FPS, it was somebody sitting down in front of a sample and looking and saying, can you see it? And I, I believe that most of people won't be able to pick it out like that, but experience it for a time and go back to something slower. And I bet the percentage is way higher on the people that can experience it. And I don't think a study like that's been done. So I think people see it without understanding at first, but once their body adjusts to it, you can perceive it. Right. It sounds like our, our analyst uh, firm, Hot Tech Vision <laughs> Analysis, needs to do a study with NVIDIA or one of these guys on this, I think. That, that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I know you're, you sounds like you're ready to trip something in there. Yeah, well, I was just going to talk about the point of, because obviously if you're getting these 360 hertz refresh rates, you're not going to be doing this at 4K, at least not today. Maybe in a few years we'll get there. So, you know, how much in a, how much resolution trade-off are you willing to make for the refresh rate increase? I mean, obviously going up to 120, 144 hertz makes a huge difference. But looking at the demo, there's not a lot of difference left between 144 and 360 hertz. So, you know, are you maybe going to take a 4k 120 and be happy over a 1080 360 um or is there maybe a 1440 240 sweet spot that you go for what do you what where do you think the curve lands for you and i mean obviously it's going to be different for every individual person and if you're playing first person shooters you're going to care a lot more about the refresh rate but it's also easier to aim when you have more resolution you can be a little more precise with it so mm. you know if you're playing single player games leisurely uh maybe you don't care about the refresh rate so much maybe you even want the cinematic 24 fps nobody, <laughs> nobody wants that but uh, <laughs> um you know what do you think yeah yeah no I, I my my sweet spot currently right now is you know i i'd like the 4k on the desktop 
Uh, but when I game, I like you know I like the thirty four forty by by uh, sixteen hundred or fourteen forty p. Fourteen forty p actually for me on on the desktop and on my phone is kind of the sweet spot right now. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I I still think there's too many. Microsoft's got to get on all the quirks with, yeah. with resolution scaling, with 4K, with, with yeah. apps and stuff. HDR. There's still so many yeah. quirks that the, the if, if you forced me today to pick a sweet spot, it's it's 1440p um, with the highest refresh rate you can afford. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I have a 32-inch 4K panel in front of me that's a 10-bit pro panel. So, like, I have other things that I, so, like, I can't get off of this yeah you're um, working for my it. daily yeah you know for my daily driver yeah. just to game because gaming is is an afterthought right now with work mm. but yeah <laughs> I, I think the sweet spot is always going to be the highest res and refresh rate someone's budget affords <laughs> francois says most of us ran 100 meters in 9.8 seconds chris needs to sleep more i don't, I don't even I don't, i'm trying to get the okay that's probably <laughs> the bags under my eyes because you know i have narcolepsy <laughs> sleep is difficult Oh, I see. I see. Well, I'm. I joined the club. I have insomnia, so I need to sleep more too. <laughs> uh, that's for sure. All right. Well, let's let's close this thing out because I think we've run out of uh, the 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 list to to talk through. But we have some important announcements to make quickly. Um, and uh, that is that we are announcing the, or we did announce earlier today, the EK Fluid Gaming Fantastic AMD PC, gaming PC, excuse me, winner. Uh, this is a giveaway we did with EK Fluid Gaming. Uh, it is a beautiful straight piped beauty uh, water block on the front end. You can see the straight pipes going to the CPU there. And it is the EK Fluid Gaming 270 Conquest that was given away. This is a Ryzen 7 3800X powered machine with uh, Radeon RX 5700 XT, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, uh, let's see, 500 gigabyte Samsung Evo, 970 Evo drive and a two terabyte secondary uh, 7200 RPM hard drive from Seagate, uh, just dialed for, uh, for performance. Asus Prime X570 Pro motherboard, great motherboard for future upgrades should you want to. And Chris, you've also discussed that it's easy. It's going to be easier to upgrade upgrade this thing because of the straight pipes. Yeah, I'm never going to claim it's going to be easy. It's not like you have a, a discrete card with its own air cooler that you can just pop out and swap back in and be on your way. There's going to be some work with it. You got to drain the system. You've got to take off the shroud that comes with the card. It's probably going to be a reference design card just because it's easier to get a water block that way. You've probably got to get the EK water block that lines up and do some pipe adjustments. But compared to a lot of the hard line liquid cooling setups that you've got to bend tubes and get very precise angles and everything else, yeah, I don't think it's going to be that difficult. So we'll see. Keep talking about it. Um, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll tackle it. We'll see. Um, maybe but... a, maybe a big Navi upgrade. Mm -hmm. So a how to right. So at any rate, it is very nice to look at, even as is without the upgrade. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. So we do have a lucky winner. If uh, you want to call out the name or yeah, drum roll, Lane B, um... <laughs> Flying Mongoose, as he's known on Twitter. Um... I'm gonna drop his. Why not? I can draw his. It's Twitter's Twitter handle is public. You, you know there what? You go. go to go to his website if you have that link handy because he's a, he's a Twitch streamer too. Oh yeah, uh, the Tuned Chaos Tech. Uh, yeah, if you if you go to the Tuned Chaos his site and then at the top there's a Twitch link. Oh, where's the and, Twitch link? Oh yeah. All right. Oh all right. cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's drop that oh, in the channel. It looks like he'd be streaming now. Is he streaming right now? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Let me. Oh, he is live. He is live. Oh, that's so funny. That's cool. Oh, wow. Wait, we should second. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can raid. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna drop. I'm gonna drop a message in his in his uh, Twitch chat too. Or can you get into Twitch quicker, Chris? Uh, I'm working on it. I'm gonna tell him we're talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to wait for the Twitch ad. Oh, I'm logging in. Oh, yeah. Never mind. I, I haven't been in there in a while. <laughs> You can probably do it easier than I can, Chris. I just sent him the YouTube link. But yeah, so tuned to chaos on Twitch. Um, he is uh, he is getting this big uh, bodacious beauty from EK Fluid Gaming. 
an all AMD powered rig um, that uh, I'm sure he will enjoy. Psyched to be able to give it away to an enthusiast, to a guy that's going to probably put it to very good use. Super Mario Maker 2 is what he's playing right now. We'll, we'll get some PC games going on that Twitch channel, I'm sure, pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. So, so anyways. Definite congratulations. Yeah, yeah. So there you go, Tuned Chaos and uh, Flying Mongoose, as he's known on uh, on Twitter. Congratulations, you are the winner of the EK Fluid Gaming AMD Gaming PC giveaway for fall. We have another giveaway afoot. Um, we're already lining up another OEM. There will be, Marco, can we say this? There will be another killer gaming rig coming soon? Yeah, it seems like it should happen in the next two to three weeks, and it will be a um, another high-end gaming PC. And if what was pitched today comes to fruition, it'll be a really high-end gaming PC. So we're hoping <laughs> it happens. That might that might not happen until well, we're, heck, we're almost there already. He said, yeah, he, he said mid-November. I mean, November is next week. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, stay tuned to Hot Hardware. Where you can find us on the web, Twitter.com/slash Hot Hardware youtube.com slash hot hardware vids hit thumbs up subscribe get notified when we're ready to go live here um and on those social channels we will always announce when we're giving away something and when something's up for grab grabs we do gleam promotions which allows folks to participate in a number of different social formats so if you don't like facebook or you don't like whatever uh, you'll probably have another option. And so we try and include as many as we can. We try and make them global when we can. This one was just U.S. only. We try and mix that up too, right? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so so stick around. Uh, join us at hothardware.com and uh, we'd, we'd love to see you. Um, and thanks very much for stopping by.